When the race still lies before me And the wind is blowing strong When the witnesses surround me And my strength is almost gone When the valley plunges deeper And life shatters all my dreams Then I lift my voice to Jesus And he gives my spirit wings God gives wings as eagles. God gives wings to fly and strength to rise above. God gives wings. God gives wings as eagles. When my feet begin to stumble and my dreams begin to crumble, I mount up on eagles' wings. God gives wings as he goes. God gives wings to fly and strength to rise above. God gives wings. God gives wings as he goes. When my feet begin to stumble and my dreams begin to crumble, I mount up on eagles. I mount up on I mount up on eagles' wings, eagles' wings. I mount up on eagles' wings. Amen. That was good, brother. Thank you. Take your Bibles, please, and open them to the book of Numbers, chapter 16. Thank you, Brother Hamilton, Megan. I'll tell you what he calls me now. He calls me Skinny. Every time I see him, he says, hi, Skinny. I just hope he's a prophet. Because <laughs> uh, false prophets have to be stoned. Most of you know the initials RB stand for real butter, <laughs> which, which has something to do with the other condition we were referencing a moment ago. My dad named me after his French teacher's son. Dad had not been saved long. When I was born, he got married a little bit after he got saved, a couple of years maybe. And uh, I was born 13 months after that. And his French teacher's son had a name that meant born again. Reborn, it was René, very common man's name in France, two E's of the end, feminine, one E, masculine. My mother wanted to name me Kenneth Raymond Willett Jr., but when my dad wanted to name me René, she said, well, then I'll give him my maiden name for his middle name, and her maiden name is Bach, B-O-C-K. It was B-O-K. My great-great-grandfather was a brewmeister in Germany and came to America, added the C to make it more American. And it was fun going through school. It was interesting. <laughs> the substitute teachers would come, and they'd call the roll, and they'd say, Renee, and I'd raise my hand, and they'd say, very funny, is Renee here? <laughs> then I got married, and my wife's name is Christine, or Chrissy. My dad would introduce us to people and say, this is my son and daughter-in-law, Chris and Renee, and they would look at me and say, hello, Chris. <laughs> They'd look at my wife and say, hello, Renee. And I went to the church in 1975, and we got a sign after a little bit, and they painted my name on the bottom, and people would call. My wife would answer the phone, and they would say, are you the pastor? <laughs> so when I was 29, Dr. Ed Nelson let me preach for him, and he said, every time I introduce you, I feel like I ought to say, madam, would you please come? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to call you R.B. So that's where that came from. Now you know all my secrets. 
It's a tremendous privilege and undeserved honor to be at this great meeting. And I know your hearts are full of what you've already heard in the music, what you've been taught in the sessions, and all that the Lord's already been doing. Brother Chapel said to me on the phone this afternoon, he said, I'm 100% there and I'm 100% here. And if anybody has 200% to give, it's Brother Chapel. Chandler's condition was extremely serious. If you could take pneumonia in a child, and it could be from a 1 to a 10, his was between the 9 and the 10. Uh, he couldn't breathe hardly at all, struggled to breathe without the oxygen there. When he wasn't on the morphine, the painkiller, he would just scream in pain. And they had to go in, the lung was completely collapsed, and take out the fluid, the infection, and the, the water that had gathered there. They had him on the strongest antibiotic possible, and he still had a very strong fever. Fever was raging in spite of that. So I know he appreciates your prayers, and I know you understand. But Chapel's been a great example. He's been an example in vision. He's been an example in organization. He's been an example in faith. He's been an example in Bible preaching. He's been an example in soul winning. But tonight, he's been a wonderful example. This is probably the biggest meeting this church has every year. It's the biggest meeting like it for independent Baptist anywhere. And he, without hesitation and without agonizing what to do, made the choice to be there with his grandson, his daughter, his family. And I appreciate that example very, very, very much. And I appreciate this church. Our daughters both came here to college and they were so loved and cared for and well taught, well educated. Both of them found their husbands here. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> we sent a lot of kids off to college. They tell me we have a couple of hundred that have gone out of our church and school over the years and gone into full time Christian work. And a lot of places you send them, they come back different. Different Bible different doctrine, different attitude toward their pastor and their home church. And you can send them here and know they're going to come back like you sent them, only better. And this place will teach them to continue in the things that you have taught them. Before I ask you to stand while I read a significant portion of Scripture, by that I mean lengthy, all Scripture is significant. I didn't mean to say others were unimportant. I should tell you that when I spoke to my wife on Monday morning, she had watched the Sunday evening service on live stream and even stayed awake for most of my sermon. And she said, why didn't you tell them I gave you that illustration at the end? She gave me the illustration at the end. <laughs> she found it on the internet. It was first used at a Jehovah's Witness convention in <laughs> Los Angeles. Numbers chapter 16, if you don't mind standing, if you're able and willing. I intend to read the entire 50 verses of this chapter. If you need to take a break, go ahead. I, uh, I don't think it's bad to read a lot of Bible. That's God's word. I love Brother Barber preaching the scriptures. Just marvelous. Love Brother Getch's sermon this morning. He, he raised all the objections people have to doing things biblically. And then he did not answer them with logic or reason. He just quoted scripture. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Koath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. That's true. And the Lord is among them. That's true. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. I don't think they were there when God 
had to really beat up Moses to get him to accept his call. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face. That's a good response to criticism. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do take ye censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, here, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, see with it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them and hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee and seek ye the priesthood also. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. What is Aaron that you murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of a land that flowed with milk and honey to kill us here in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? Over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offerings. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord thou and they and Aaron tomorrow. And take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense thereon and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them all in a moment. And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents, their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own hand. It wasn't my idea. I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit. Then shall ye understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them. And they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And they came out of fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he take up the censers out of the burning and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hallowed. The censers of these sinners against their own souls, let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the Lord, 
Therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. Now the age of the priest took the brazen censers wherewith they that were burned had offered, and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses. And against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense, and made an atonement for the people he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700, besides them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Father, guide me by your spirit to say just what you want said. May I skip over the parts that would not be helpful or pleasing to you? May I add whatever you would put in my mind that you want said? Bind Satan and his demons. Keep them from removing from our heart's soil the seed of this perfect book you've given to us. Help us to be willing now to consecrate ourselves as good ground, eager to receive what you have for us. Empower me by your spirit, I pray. Bless the preaching, the invitation in Jesus' name. We'll promise to praise you for all that is done. Amen. There are always rebels who want for themselves the position that God has given to another. Sad thing is that they're quite often able to get a number of people to follow them to destruction. I want to give you an explanation about this passage and then show you an illustration that I see in the passage and then make the Lord helping me an application. The problem began with quality people. Korah was a Levite and Dathan and Abiram were Reubenites, uh, uh, descendants of the firstborn of the twelve sons of Jacob. You know when trouble comes in your church, it usually doesn't start with some good ordinary working man, a carpenter, a, a layman that's working on the assembly line and the plan. It's usually somebody with money. It's usually somebody that's a boss where they're at work and they think they can boss you too. But they got quarrelsome. They didn't like Moses, what he was doing. They, they gathered 250 other key people, leaders, uh, elders of Israel, men of renown, the Bible says. And, and they said, Moses, you take too much upon you. Well, they said, this isn't any land of milk and honey. You brought us out into this wilderness. Of course, you bozos. You just voted two chapters earlier not to go into the land of milk and honey. Duh. Let me tell you what happens. Backslidden followers blame leaders for the results of their own disobedience. Sit in the pew, don't do what the Bible says, don't raise their children according to the Word of God, don't tithe, don't go soul winning, don't live a separated life, and trouble comes, and they say, that's all because of that church. That's a cult over there. They were practicing spiritual abuse. 
I was listening to a so-called Christian radio station one night. It's about the only kind I can find. They had Bruce Naramore on there, the nephew of Clyde Naramore. And he was being interviewed, I think, by James Dobson. And they were talking about raising children. And he said, well, Bruce, how do you feel about saying to your child, you know, you shouldn't do this or that because the Bible says not to. And I heard Bruce Naramore say, well, you know, Jim, I have mixed emotions about that. I'm a little concerned about using the Bible as a club to beat over the head of your child. What a lousy attitude toward the Word of God. This, this book is God's will for my life. This book tells me everything I need to know about God. This book is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. This book will keep me out of trouble. This book tells me how to treat my friends and deal with my enemies, how to love my wife, how to raise my children, how to worship my God, how to handle my business affairs. Now, this book is not a club. This book is God's gift to His people. We disobey it at our peril and have no right to blame God when troubles become because of our disobedience. They had quality people that got quarrelsome, and then they got a quantity. The Bible says that they were able to persuade the whole congregation to turn against Moses and against Aaron. I won't go into all the details, but if you understand where the different tribes had their lodging as the children of Israel would settle down for a time in their journey across the wilderness, it, it's unusual that you'd have uh, these people all together in one tabernacle. Matthew Henry says that what he believes is that they had assembled a large tabernacle of their own, and he said they gathered there and put their flag out in defiance of Moses. Whether he's right about that or not, it's pretty clear that they were in open rebellion. And like all rebels, they wanted to get somebody else to go with them. It's not a problem if you disagree with your pastor. I quite frequently disagree with myself. I'm preaching and I look around and see who said that. And when you do, you can just say, well, it's all right. Uh, maybe I'll understand it later. Or you can go ask him a question. You come to your preacher with a good spirit and a good attitude. Just say, I'd like to understand this. And he'll explain it to you. And sometimes you'll say, oh, okay, now I get it. And sometimes you still won't get it. You'll still disagree. That's okay. You get two legitimate choices then. You can say, well, it's not a Bible issue. And it's not going to make any difference. It's uh, just something I see a little differently, I'll go on and serve God. Or you can say, no, that's a Bible issue. My pastor is saying you've got to get baptized to get to heaven. And then you can leave. Alone. Without trying to take anybody with you. But you don't want to do that. You're going around and say, do you, think, do you think they ought to have that leadership conference in June? It's hot in Lancaster in June. It's hot in Lancaster in Every time. <laughs> Do you, you think they should have that fat, bald guy from Michigan every year? I get a little tired of him. <laughs> you think we should have got rid of these beautiful pews we had and put in these chairs? Well, this is just like the theater. Well, how do you know? <laughs> hey! God didn't call you to be the George Gallup of your church to go around and take everybody's opinion. And you get those people that, that, that they get a little power in their own lives and they want to extend it where it doesn't belong and they take other people with them. You watch out about that. God will always take care of His servants. And you see a quenching. Moses on the behalf and under the instruction of God issues a challenge. He said, come on out. Separate yourselves from among this congregation. Come on out and we'll see who God has chosen. And he said, hey, here's the deal. If you die the ordinary death of a typical man, then God hadn't spoken by me. But if God does a new thing and he opens the earth and you get swallowed up in it, then you know the Lord's spoken by me. That'd be a pretty good sign. I know some deacons, not at our church, but I know some deacons. I, I'd be glad to see a reenactment.
And it's incredible what happens. It came to pass, verse 31, as it made an end to speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, and all that appertained unto them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. I don't know about you, but if I'd been on the other side about this time, I'd be getting right. I, I don't do right all the time, but I, I repent rather quickly. I learned it as a little boy. My mother would say, bend over. And I repented. I'd say, I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good. I was sincere. And she just believed there was more reinforcement needed to the lesson. Wow. And after that, and after fire comes and consumes from the Lord the rest of the 250 people, the children of Israel make a very interesting choice. Here's what they say in verse 41. On the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. No, those were the rebels, and they didn't kill them. God killed them. They canonized the rebels, and they stigmatized the righteous. And then God sends after the choice of the congregation, as we see the quenching of this rebellion, God sends punishment, pronouncement of the people. You killed the people of the Lord. And so God says, I'm sending a plague. Get out of there, verse 45. Get him out, get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their face. God sends a plague and he says to Moses and Aaron that it is his intention to destroy the entire congregation of Israel because all of them have rebelled against God. Something really strange happens in verse 46. What do you do when people who have opposed you have the obvious judgment of God upon their life? Yes. <laughs> Bring it. Huh? Proverbs tells us, don't you be happy when God judges people. He'll see that, be unhappy with you, and stop the judgment on them. These people were continually complaining and murmuring against Moses. They were repeatedly rejecting his counsel. If it had not been for them, they'd already been in the promised land. And they're having all these troubles because they persistently want to do their own thing and go their own way and make their own decisions. And Moses, verse 46, said unto Aaron, Take a censer. Put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And here comes a champion. The high priest, Moses doesn't do it himself. Aaron is the high priest. Aaron has special access to God that nobody else has. He's allowed one time a year to enter into the holy of holies. Nobody else can ever go in there. And Aaron at this time, they tell me, is about a hundred years old, almost a hundred. Can you picture the old man in his priestly robes and his brother younger than him, but the leader of the congregation instructs him to take his censer and to go and make an atonement before the people, the people that just wanted to get rid of him, the people that just complained about him, the people that were just maligning and, and slandering and libeling him, the people that were just criticizing him. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that Aaron ran, see him on, on ancient legs and tottering steps, but doing the best he can to take the censer and he runs between the people. See the courage that he has, the commitment that he has, the compassion that he has. He's been the object of their wrath, but he's willing now to be the instrument of their salvation. By the way, I would just like to suggest 
you be real careful about being part of the crowd that attacks the man of God. I hope it's all right to say this. I texted the brother about whom I'm going to speak to ask his opinion about this, and I received no answer. And the Bible says silence gives consent, I think. <laughs> maybe 25, maybe 30 years ago, my friend, Pastor Rick Finley, wonderful pastor, great church in Durham, North Carolina. I'd preached there a few times and bad trouble came. Vicious uprising. He called me on the phone and said, could you come down and moderate our business meeting? And I grabbed a ticket and went down and I believe there were six uniformed police officers on the property. The meeting was recorded audio, video, and stenographically. The news cameras are there. They heard about it, trying to get in and take pictures. They did not succeed, thank the Lord. And the congregation voted to accept me as the moderator, and we did everything best we knew according to Robert's rules of order. And all those people were harsh. They were not spirit-filled. They were mean. I remember one of the main charges they had against Brother Finley was that he had purchased some dog food along with some items for the church. He had reimbursed the church for the dog food, but it hadn't occurred to him that because the rest of the purchase was tax-exempt, he hadn't paid the sales tax on his dog food. You know how many people in jail right now for doing the same thing? They thought that was a big deal. And I watched them, and, they, and they, they were mean. And I watched Brother Finley, after he overwhelmingly won the vote, stand up and say, I love you people. I want you to stay here. He said, to those of you that supported me, I plead with you to love these people and accept them. It was a little bit like Aaron that day. And that may be why, as a great church today, that may be why the ringleader has been reconciled and is a faithful member of that church today. But wait a minute. One of those men just after that meeting learned he had prostate cancer. His adult daughter suffered a stroke. Another wound up having that back surgery and his underage teenage driver totaled their car, didn't have a license. Another lost her son in his 40s. He'd come to the business meeting on June 18th just to vote against the preacher, died of a heart attack 24 hours later. Another man lost two fingers and severely damaged the rest of his hand in a freak accident with a saw. Another had his mother pass away. Another was fired from a job that he'd held for 20 years. Another was badly injured in a freak automobile accident on Thanksgiving Day. Her son passed out on the wheel and she said to one of the ladies, I've learned my lesson. I'll never say anything against the preacher again. And my favorite is the story of one man who had a rental house in a kind of a bad section of town. He hadn't got the rent for a while. He went down to discover somebody piece by piece had stolen the house. <laughs> you think it's bad, Brother Burke? They steal our cars in the RU ministries. They stole his house. God will take care of his servants. He'll vindicate them. But I look at this passage and I see in Aaron an appropriate biblical illustration. Aaron is the high priest and he takes the censer and he makes atonement for the people. And he reminds me of another high priest. I, I love the verse in 2 Timothy about our Savior says, but now about the gospel now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, rejected and destroyed. Despised. He died praying for those who had called for his crucifixion. I love the fact that Aaron stood in behalf of those who had opposed him, but I'm far more impressed that the Lord Jesus bore in his body all the sins of all the world as he hung on Calvary's cross. Oh, it was terrible that the whips came across his back, the cat of nine tails clawing his flesh out. It was awful that they plucked out his beard and jammed the crown of thorns into his head. It was excruciating. 
excruciatingly painful when they nailed him to that cross and he hung there, not as the artist depicted him with a loincloth, but completely shamefully unclothed. And the victim of crucifixion would usually die, not from the, sh- the loss of blood, but from asphyxiation because the muscles across his chest would contract as he hung on the nails on his hands. But he discovered if he very painfully put weight on his feet where the nails were good. Get a little gasp of breath, but as awful as all that was, it was nothing compared to the suffering that he bore when he became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. No word escaped his mouth when they hammered the nails into his hands and feet. No word came up from his voice when they dropped that cross into the hole that they'd prepared for it took most of the bones out of their sockets. No word was uttered when the whip came across his back. But when God the Father turned his back on God the Son and darkness covered the face of the earth and for the first time in all eternity, God the Father and God the Son were separated one from another. another. Then he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a Savior. I admire Aaron, but I adore Jesus. I'm endeared to Aaron, but I exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. I glance at Aaron, but I gaze with awe at Jesus. I'm pleased with Aaron, but I praise from the bottom of my grateful heart my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who filled with his own blood the censer of salvation and took it to heaven, the perfect atonement for my misbehavior and for the wrongs of the whole world, and thereby saved me from the penalty of hell and saved me for, uh, so that I could enjoy heaven for forever Jesus oh how sweet the name Jesus let us all proclaim the precious name of Jesus oh I love Aaron I'm glad for him but nothing compared to the wonderful marvelous gratitude that I have that my Savior Jesus died so I would never have to spend a moment in hell all hail the power of Jesus name Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and crown him Lord of all. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou, if ever I loved thee. My Jesus, tis now. But can I make an application from this passage? It says that Aaron stood between the dead and the living. There is now no order of Levites. There is no Aaronic priesthood on the earth. We are kings and priests unto our God. We have direct access to God. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And it is Jesus and he alone who can perform the ministry of atonement. But the delivery of the message is entrusted to us. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Ye are ambassadors uh, for us. Uh, you need to reconcile man to God. Paul told, uh, was told by the Spirit of God in, in the book of Acts uh, what he was supposed to do at the time of his conversion. He said, I'll tell you what, uh, you're going to rise and stand on your feet. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and those things in which I will appear unto thee delivering thee by from the people and uh, from the Gentiles and whom I now send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in them and I know we all say we believe in it and I know say we all say we subscribe to it that I'm real concerned concern that not very many of us are doing it anymore. It is our job to give the gospel to every creature. Everybody who is saved has an obligation to everybody who's not saved to tell them how they can be saved. It is the preacher's job but it's not only his job. It is the staff's job but it's not only their job. It is the deacon's job but it's not only their job. It is the Sunday school teacher's job and the bus worker's job but it is the job of every child of God to spread the gospel everywhere they go. 
know, and I hope the Lord will help us to understand how serious and how solemn and how sacred our responsibility is to hold the censer of salvation high, to stand between the living and the dead, to stop the plague of sin and tell them there is salvation in Jesus Christ. Do you understand, bus worker, the children that you minister to are sought after by almost nobody except the devil. No other churches are after them, but oh, Satan would love to put them into a gang. Satan would love them to become customers of the drug dealers. Satan would love for their lives to be corrupted and polluted, and they already come from that kind of an atmosphere. Every time I drive one of our buses, I do it once in a while, when we have a, a time we run buses on Saturday, I drive, and they, they'll tell me where the stops are, and I watch the children come out, and I see the workers greet them and love them and encourage them. I see the terrible circumstances from which they come, and I say, my. I am so glad First Baptist Church of Bridgeport is still running 18 or 20 buses. After all these years, I'm not about to stop. I'm not looking for something easier to do. We're standing between the living and the dead. There's somebody in your class, teacher. They'll be there this week or the next one or the one after that. You won't know when, but they'll only be there one time. Sirhan, Sirhan. Assassinated Robert Kennedy, if I recall correctly, but there was a time he attended the service of an independent, fundamental Baptist church. I don't know what happened. I don't know if there could have been a difference, but I wonder if everybody had known then there was a man who had a path of wickedness and evil ahead of him. If somebody wouldn't have held the censor a little higher and somebody would have tried a little harder and somebody wouldn't have had a bit of a tear in their eye, realizing they were standing between the living and the dead. Layman at your workplace, what a wonderful video. Amen. What a marvelous illustration of the effect of the gospel. And I've been so thrilled to see the people in the video seated right in front of me tonight. A soul winner witnessed to somebody else and his wife got saved. And he witnessed to somebody else and he got saved. And his mother got saved and his father got saved. And his family got saved. You can't beat the gospel. Amen. But you can hide it. You can hold it. Paul said in writing to the Thessalonian church, moved by the Spirit of God, as we were put in trust with the gospel. My mother-in-law lives with us. She's 90 years old. Great, wonderful Christian lady. She has a revocable living trust. My wife is the executor, the trustee. When I first learned about this, the lawyer said, there is one problem with the trust. He said, you have to trust your trustee. Because as he explained it to me, when my mother-in-law dies, everything comes under the control of my wife. Now it says in there that she'd like it to be divided equally among the four children, or maybe three it's down to now. One of them wasn't doing very good. We may get her to knock off another one before it's over. Now, my wife has the legal right to spend her mother's inheritance whenever she goes to heaven, heaven any way she wants to, but she doesn't have the moral right or the ethical right to do that. And when God gave us the gospel, he put us in trust. It was a solemn responsibility. And you may be able to live the rest of your life and not tell people about Jesus, but you can't do that morally. You can't do that ethically. You can't do that and be right with God. When he gave you the gospel, he said, here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to tell everybody else else about it. I was a youth pastor for two years before I went to our church at the age of 22. A couple of girls came to the youth activity one time, sisters Rita and Penny Shire. And Rita was older and said she was saved went by the house and Mrs. Shire was there ironing. She allowed me to talk to Penny and allowed me to give her the gospel. Penny was in the seventh grade. I could hold on. I said, Penny, would you like to trust Christ as your Savior? And her mother said, she's not old enough for that. I said, oh, Miss Shire, we're not talking about joining the church or getting baptized. I made the decision I'm talking to Penny about when I was four years old. She said, she's not old enough for that. I said, well, if, if Penny were to come to another youth activity and if she wanted to trust Christ while she was there, would that be okay? And strangely, the mother said, yes. A year or so after that, I went 30 minutes up the road to the church. I've had the privilege of pastoring for all these years. 
lady called Elsie Britt, one of the youth workers that we served with there. And she said, Pastor Renee, did you hear about Penny Shire? I said, no. A man in a pickup truck driving down Mount Morris Road, the street that Penny lived on, then it deliberately left a note, pulled his car, man in a truck, Penny was in her with her dad in the pickup truck, I apologize, man pulled his car out in front of their truck, ran into them head on. One of the gas tanks had saddle tanks on that pickup, exploded. Penny Shire was horribly burned and in the Hurley Hospital in Flint. I went down to see her. Wouldn't have known it was her if I hadn't been told that ahead of time. Bandages and blisters and twisted flesh. And she was in a coma. Sometimes people can understand you when they're in a coma. Sometimes they can't. I said, Penny, it's, it's Pastor Renee. Penny, you can still get saved. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be at a youth activity. I'd given the invitation many times. I'd always look to see if she raised her hand. She never had, but I always tried to make sure I gave her an opportunity. And I said, you, you can get saved now. You can, you can just ask Jesus to save you. You know the gospel. Penny, if you ask Jesus to save you, Penny, could you, could you move a finger? Could you, could you blink an eye? She never moved. She died a few days after that. I don't know if she's in heaven or hell. I'm glad I gave her the gospel. I'm glad I tried it the other times. I didn't know I was standing between the living and the dead. My wife and I knocked on a door one day, apartment building, a couple of miles from the church. Redhead lady named Chris Soroya answered the door. And we sat down with her on that Thursday morning and gave her the gospel. And she prayed and trusted Christ. And she came to church pretty good, had two kids, Leslie and Aisha. Later on, she moved into a house. Kids kept coming. She didn't always come. She had a boyfriend by then and wasn't living for the Lord like she had been. One day, one of our ladies, Shelby Matheson, went by to pick the kids up. And she heard noises in the house. And a little girl came, either Leslie or Aisha, and she said, Mike's here. He's been here all night. He won't let my mom go. And Chris came to her and said, Oh, good, let's all go to church today. And then she mouthed the words, Call the police. And Mike dragged her back in the house and he started to yell. He saw the daughter run across the yard to the neighbor's house and he said, You sent her to call the police. Now you're in trouble. And she heard a scuffle. And the other daughter came to the door and it was Easter Sunday. She had some little Easter grass in her hand. She said, my mom's dead. Mike just killed my mom. And Shelby said, well, we don't know that. Your mom's hurt maybe. But he said, no, he killed her. And then she took the Easter grass and put it around her neck. And said, he did this to her. I didn't know that day that I visited that apartment. And my wife and I were standing between the living and the dead. And visited our church named Thomas Head. I keep his card in my desk as a reminder. The Thursday that I was out to go make some calls and had his as one of them was hot. We just had a swimming pool installed at our property. A man came up from Georgia and put an in-ground pool in it. Just the cost of the materials as a kindness to us. And I wanted to get out of that car and get in that pool. And I was done. It was time to quit. But I thought maybe I'd make one more call. I'll go ahead and see this guy. And I went there. He was about 26 or so. I think you can see on the card he was between 25 and 29. His parents were gone. He lived with them. There's a couple of 19 or so year old girls in the house. And they were having a good time and not much interested in what I had to say. And as I gave the gospel, they kind of rolled their eyes and smirked. And, and I had this thought, I should just get out of here and come back later on when they're not there and then he'll get saved did you know it's not my job to decide how much gospel to give to people I'm supposed to give all I can to everybody I can they make the decision how far I'm able to go but I continued and the spirit of God got a hold of those girls and their expressions changed and their hearts began to soften and they all three Thomas Head and the two girls there prayed and trusted Christ as their Savior. It was 10 days later, I picked up the Sunday paper. 
and read that a 26-year-old man driving down Holland Road was killed when a car ran the stop sign, smashed into a broadside, and I looked a little further, and I saw it was Thomas Head. I didn't know it that Thursday night when I decided to make one more visit. Decided I could forego getting into the swimming pool for a little longer. I didn't know that I was standing between the living and the dead. And you don't know it, but there's sometimes your last time, some opportunities your only opportunity. Some chances your only chance. Our deacons, Joe Galgansky and I were out soul winning one snowy Saturday, which probably means it was in the winter, but not necessarily in Michigan. <laughs> 49 visitors that I was privilege of the Lord to have on the open house Sunday was really not very good for the number of promises I had, but it snowed that day. And we were having dinner on the grounds and inflatables for the kids to enjoy. It was snowing at 11 o'clock in the morning. But I... <coughs> so you, you can't say for sure what it was. It was cold that day, and Brother Joe and I saw a little boy rummaging around in the snow banks to get a bottle out. He didn't have gloves, so he's putting his hands up in his coat sleeves and going to get the bottle and go in the store and buy some candy. I said, let's go talk to that boy. And we stopped. Probably the kid was in second or third grade. And, and this voice inside me said, now don't try to give him the gospel. He's young. He won't understand it. Get him to come to church. And after he's been there a while, th then he'll understand it and he can get saved. That's what it says in the Bible. Later is the day of salvation. Later is the accepted time. And I went ahead and obeyed the Bible instead of the devil. That's another good idea. And I gave the boy the gospel. And he prayed and trusted Christ. I said, do you want to come to church? And told him we had a bus coming by. And he said, oh, yeah, that's great. And, and he told us where he lived. He said he lived with his grandmother. And he pointed out the house to us. We got back in the car. He ran a block or two. And he got to the house before we did. As we walked up to the door, we heard a shrill voice say, Now you can't go to that blankety blankety blank church. And I knocked on the door. His grandmother came to the door. She said, Yes, I played dumb. It's not hard for me. I live near there. <laughs> I said, uh, We met your grandson out visiting. We're from First Baptist. We're on a bus by here. We'd love to have your grandson. No, he can't go to that church. I don't know what happened to that boy. I don't know where he is. But I know where he'll be one day. And I know the only chance I ever had to give him the gospel was that chance. Heavenly Father, he gave us a great example of a compassionate high priest risking his own life to be able to deliver those who hated him, who lied about him, who falsely accused him. And you gave us a great high priest, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us and loves the world and is not willing that any should perish. And then you told us it's our job. Lord, help us to be serious about it. That was right. We all should be passing out tracks. We all should be witnessing to people. It's not just for a few. And help us understand that when we get our meal tonight, the waitress maybe on the verge of eternity, we don't know, we might be standing between the living and the dead. We go back home and be kind of tempting to relax a little bit and just take it easy after our busy conference. There are people on our bus routes and people that could attend our Sunday school class and people in our neighborhoods. And we may be the only thing standing between them and eternal damnation. God, help us to realize all of us should be diligent. Speak to our hearts. One of our staff members, Brother J.D. Howell, is here. He's staying in a motel here in town. It's not far from here. 
He said, I gave the lady or the man at the desk a track today. I got in about four o'clock. He said it was the first one he'd gotten all day. I wonder if anybody else who was a Christian went by that motel room. I wonder who says, you know what, Brother Willette? God's dealing with me. I, I want to do a better job. I want to do what I'm supposed to. I want to hold the censer of salvation high and tell them there is atonement in the blood of Jesus Christ and they don't have to spend eternity in hell. I want to do my job of standing between the living and the dead more like God wants me to. God's dealt with me about it. Pray with me. If you say that, hold your hand up high. God bless you, Father. You've seen the sea of hands and you know our hearts. Help us to act in obedience to what you've said. And may decisions made here tonight bear fruit for years to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. The Spirit of God spoke in your heart. The altar is open. I invite you to come while the music plays and do business with God. Take whatever time you need when you feel like you've done the business God wants you to do. Feel free to tiptoe back to your seat. Father, thanks for this great meeting. So many things we've heard and so many things we've learned and so many things we've been reminded of and so many ways in which we've been convicted. We probably would confuse ourselves trying to do it all. But help us to walk in the Spirit, and to be guided, hear that inner voice, that impulse. It'll give the extra attention when it's needed that'll let us know of an opportunity we might not have observed. And Lord, I pray many, 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 many people would hear the gospel because of the work you're doing in this meeting. Amen. Many, many, many would be saved. We'll thank you for all you've done. We thank you for what you have done in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated for just a moment? For the chapel is not back yet, but he is, I'm assured he would be watching on live stream. I would have done this before I spoke, but I was hoping he'd get back in time. I wanted to say something on my behalf and the behalf of the preachers here for him on his 30th anniversary. I appreciated so much the words Brother Kim said, and I won't be redundant in repeating that. Uh, they didn't, I, when I heard they had a book of letters, I thought, I forgot to write my letter. And then I realized that, I didn't forget, they didn't invite the the outsiders to do it. This did they want to be just from the church. And that's wonderful. I appreciate that. But we as pastors owe a great debt to Brother Chapel. There's not a better place to learn how to do biblical church ministry than where you are right now. There's not a man who devotes himself to the cause of Christ and then is willing to help others outside his own ministry any more than Brother Paul Chapel is. There's not a man that has achieved the blessing and the what we call success that he has, and it remained as teachable as Brother Chapel has. 
And so I put a few thoughts down, Brother Chapel. I hope you're seeing this, and I, I hope you know this represents the love and appreciation of thousands of preachers. 30 years, 30 years of labor, of sweat, and work, and toil. The starting well before the dawn and burning midnight oil, of bearing heavy burdens no one else could understand. 30 years of struggle in this windy desert land. 30 years of sacrifice, $60 million worth. At LBC, your giving number is assigned at birth. With stewardship and missions giving, yearly offerings too, the faithful people did much more than they thought they could do. With housing purchases postponed, vacations set aside, an old car driven longer, not in pity, but with pride, believing quite correctly that it all was worth the cost to build another building, so to reach, then train the lost. Yet what he asked of others, he would do himself and more. He led the way in sacrifice, amazing loads he bore. No salary, no allowance for a house or for a car, no cash to pay for rider truck to bring him from afar. No helper asked to labor more than what their pastor did. You'd never find him AWOL, loafing somewhere off the grid. He led by his example, by his actions set the pace, consistent, solid, faithful, as he ran for God his race. And 30 years of standing, 30 years of standing in a world awash with change, quite willing to be criticized and thought by others strange, so firm in faith and doctrine, not conforming to the world and never even flinching as the devil's darts were hurled. And 30 years of winning souls out faithfully each week. This shepherd always led the flock, the strays and lost to seek. And then they were discipled, firmly grounded in the word. The Great Commission clearly kept, not modified or blurred. And 30 years of vision to do more for our dear Lord. To dream and plan and do it with the church in one accord. No resting on his laurels, no living in the past but ever looking forward, emphasizing things that last. And 30 years of heartaches, of cruel, unjust attack, of praying for his enemies and of never fighting back. Some fickle friends forgot the help he gave them when in need. They stabbed him in the back and seemed to love to watch him bleed. And 30 years of faithfulness, of staying by the stuff and never giving up or saying stop, I've had enough, committed to his Savior, to his people, to his wife. He's been a great example of a true surrendered life. So thank you, church and pastor. You've shown us what can be done, the battles you have fought and all the victories you have won. We know you'll keep on serving till you reach the other shore, but we'd be mighty glad if God would give you 30 more. I had this thought this morning. I spoke to but a small percentage of the pastors here. I doubt if 10% of the delegates knew what I was doing. I taught a session that Brother Chapel was unable to teach, and maybe 50 or 60 men were there. And I said, it'd be nice if we could do something to let Brother Chapel know we, our hearts go out to him of the heavy load he bears at this time and the burden he has with this conference and his grandson's illness. And uh, somebody said, yeah, you ought to do that. It'd be a hug from the Lord. And with just a handful of people, uh, counting $200 that's been promised to come in later because they didn't have cash available, there will be here, I think, uh, somewhere around $1,350 or $1,400 Brother chapel uh, just because we love you, we're grateful for you. If you want to give more, I'm sure he'll take it later on. I was looking for someone honest to give it to. Okay. Uh, I, I'm putting it here. What happens after this is not my problem. But would you, <laughs> Brother Chapel will see the video and he's probably watching now. Would you help me thank him for all that he's done to be such a blessing to us. We love you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Amen. Brother Let, thank you for that message. Thank you for your friendship and your love to our pastor. And uh, 
Uh, thank you all as well for your prayers for our pastor and his family uh, throughout this trial that they've been facing. You can be seated. It's hard to believe it, but we have just one day left of this conference, and we've got a few things that we'd like to remind you of.